Hello, my name is Paul Isaacs. I'm the director of Lenaro's data center and cloud group, and it also incorporates high performance computing with artificial intelligence. So hopefully it's not too much of a mouthful. Um, today's topic is beyond ML. So uh, what I'm interested in is where we take ML and then Vern, we take the next step into looking at how we can move from ML to artificial intelligence. And the reason, the reason I say we move from ML to AI is uh, a si simple case of machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So we try to avoid the hype, um, hype cycle of artificial intelligence. We've already had two winters um at a, of artificial intelligence and what i mean by the winters is where we've had so much hype that artificial intelligence will deliver and yet uh, after a few years of funding something doesn't happen the market dwindles and and then uh, we try to find more funding for extra research and they say oh no, last time you promised x you didn't deliver so that's, a, that's happened twice, and we're really trying to avoid a third winter of artificial intelligence. So we'd just like to be clear that machine learning is a subset of AI, but machine learning is not totally AI. So where does machine learning actually fit in? So we can use um, computers to analyze patterns. But why would we use a computer if all we actually want to do is count to a billion? You wouldn't ask a human to count to a billion, and it'd be quite wasteful to ask a computer to count to a billion. But you could use, say, a one gigahertz uh, clock, and that would count to one billion in one second, or one hertz clock would just tick, 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 tick once every second. Um, and what you've got there is a small electronic device, very power efficient, very simple, but all it can do is just go tick, tick, tick. It's, it's not a great uh, thing to do. Now, we, look at, we want to be more complex than just counting to a billion. We may want machine learning, for instance, to sort Lego pieces. So if we have a look at a Lego piece, you know, typical green, Lego block there. Now that, that sounds great. It, it's just a single brick, but uh, and a machine can look at the orientation of the Lego brick, figure out what shape, size, color, and sort it. In fact, the link I've put on uh, on the screen is a Lego sorting machine. Now, you don't necessarily need machine learning to do the Lego sorting machine. In fact, you could just use straightforward electronics, which would look at the colors and sort, look at the shape and sort, look at the, um, the, the weight of uh, the Lego and sort. But each time, these are dedicated uh, actions within the machine. Now, what happens if you get a mixture of Lego? It gets very, very complicated because it's what shape, what color, what size, what orientation, it then gets more complicated. So machine learning will help, but it's, it's not the, an ideal solution for sorting these things. So how do we progress? So if we look at um, the, the scale of the problems, the orders of magnitude of the problems, so I've taken the Lego brick, and that seemed to be a reasonable problem if it was just one brick. It quickly becomes a problem if there's multiple bricks. What happens if you actually want uh, very low latency so that whatever it, your system is analyzing, you get a very quick response? You wouldn't want an autonomous car driving down the motorway and, and then waiting for half a second before it gets information back that a car is approaching. That half a second will be quite critical. The cars travel um, a considerable distance. So you've got to look at the, the latency, high speed, 
Um, de depends on the domain. You don't want to just say, look at one problem. Once you've got the answer, go to the next problem and then the next problem because there could be multiple uh, interactions. What happens if more than one car is, is coming at you? You wouldn't want sequential uh, sort of algorithms working in there. So instead, what you'd like is parallel synchronized uh, events where, you can, where your computer system could identify multiple activities, multiple events at the same time, and they would all be interlinked they don't have to be uh, order dependent, so it doesn't matter what comes in first or second. It, it just needs to be processed in parallel uh, very, very quickly. But that assumes that these actions are occurring at predefined or reasonable time frames of, um, between one activity and another. What happens if it's just a random event? Um, you don't know when it's going to occur how often it's going to occur, how many events at the same time are going to occur. So this is where we have to look at asynchronous events. So if you've just got a, uh, a machine learning system, you need it to be asynchronous for multiple event activities, but you also need it to be parallel because there, there could be several activities at the same time. So this sounds like a very large, complex problem. And at the moment, we tend to have dedicated computer systems with dedicated programs running specific event profiles. It's not really a way towards a true artificial intelligence. So what I want to say here is machine learning artificially obfuscates AI. In other words, machine learning tries to abstract particular functions and do those functions very, very well. And the sum total of all those functions, people may be drawn into believing that it is artificial intelligence. But it's not. It is pattern matching. It's high-speed calculations. It's probabilities. Um, so it, we have to be careful that machine learning isn't all AI. What do we do then if we're not looking at pattern match, matching? So we can look at things called spiking neural networks. Now, spiking neural networks try to map how the brain works. And what we look at is if a spike has occurred or not, well, we could translate that into being a binary digit. We could count a succession of spikes. So it could be a burst of spikes, a space, a burst of spikes, a space, or we count the gaps between the spikes. Quickly, you start to think that, hang on a minute, if there are gaps or patterns of gaps or specific numbers of spikes, well, we can then go back to machine learning and say, if Five, five of this pattern occur and four of this pattern occur, then maybe something's actually happened, an event. So that event could be an audio input, a visual input, a, a sensory input, and then we could act upon it. So it sounds like we're, we're trying to get uh, the capabilities of machine learning with its pattern matching overlapping how we think the brain might be working if we're looking purely at spikes in spiking neural networks. This might not be the case though. We can use um, everyday available machine learning frame frameworks. TensorFlow is one of them. And we're, I've put a link in here, and the images are the what's known as the Ezekovich uh, models. And these, the, the pictures here, you can see that they are specific patterns. Those specific patterns you can overlay into TensorFlow so that you can translate when a particular stimulus occurs, then do something. So when the event occurs, do an action. 
Likewise, for, uh, um, for TensorFlow, we also have an example for PyTorch. So Guillaume Chevalier, he's uh, put together an example in Python and PyTorch on how to do learning. This is called Hebian learning. So if a particular spike tree occurs several times, then attribute it to a particular activity. And so it is still pattern matching and it's still machine learning. But by calling it spiking neural networks, it sounds like we're, we're applying it directly to how the brain works. It's still actually a digital brain. And yet our brain, is, it, it doesn't work in ones and zeros. It, it's a fully analog system. So we're still not quite there yet. However, if you'd like to keep up with all the machine learning activities, uh, Lenaro hosts this website, nlplatform.org for ARM, and uh, you will be able to take a look at the blogs, notes, and news on how we're getting on with various machine learning activities. But this particular talk is more than machine learning. It's about artificial intelligence. So, We'll just check on the performance side of things. So we're still talking on the digital brain and spiking your networks. I've put a link in here for a very nice YouTube video, which has a rotating cube of networks. And you'll be able to uh, see how, when a particular character is recognized, how the network is then built and, and how it activates. I draw your attention to the spiking neural network specifically because it appears that only clusters, certain uh, clusters of the neural connect connections actually fire rather than just a, spe a specific pattern across the entire network, which is something that you might see with a perceptron uh, example. Okay. I, I hinted that our brain is not digital, okay? Our, our brain is analog. So how do we learn if we're not using machine learning? Let's say that children learn by doing, not simply by following a rule book. So it's not an if then else, like programming code. Um, we don't expect them to be able to understand everything from the moment they're born. They have to learn by example, by doing. So we don't give them the keys to the car, uh, car uh, to an infant. Um, we don't ask them to read the driver's manual. They're not able to. So they have minimal abilities, an infant does. So if you think when a baby is born, they don't crawl. They roll by accident. They, they only uh, input effectively or sensory um, attention is I'm hungry I must cry therefore I will then be fed and I will stop crying so it's stimulation it's uh, it, but what they're actually looking for is warmth shelter um, and and emotional support so I know this because I've got seven children of my own and six grandchildren so I've seen the difference between having spent more than 30 years in IT programming computers versus how the, a human actually interacts and learns. So don't take my word for it, though. No, no, so it's purely by my experience and the examples. So what happens within the body uh, to, in terms of stimulation when we get a, a stimuli? Uh, so maybe we hear a sound, maybe there's a light. Um, we, we get cascading uh, neurons. So our neurons start firing up um, that they've received a particular input. They have not got a clue what the particular input is. It's purely an electrochemical stimulation. And if we uh, just allow the neurons to cascade their output throughout, then we'd actually end up with brain seizures because we'd get too many neurons firing and we wouldn't actually be able to make sense of what's actually happening. So we need to inhibit 
as well as stimulate. And then a balance needs to be found in the way that we learn. Examples of the inhibitors uh, can be just simply relaxation, resting, because of what you're doing is you're reducing the number of stimuli that are coming in. And what I found, and what appears to be true, is muscle, mem muscle memory is uh, if you do a task repetitively, you will find that you will be able to do it quicker, more efficiently over a period of time. Um, I haven't programmed line by line code in my head to actually achieve this. So what I've done is learnt by example, learnt by doing. Okay. Um, what I find is that if I'm able to pick up this Lego brick, I can also pick up this glass of water. Now, I've used hands, gripping, sensory uh, eyesight uh, to actually visualize what I'm doing, and vibration to, to know that I place the glass back down. I haven't programmed that line by line. So I'm, I need some other way to look into uh, creating an artificial intelligence without having to code these line by line routines. So we have to find out some sort of uh, in between because I'm not about to start uh, building biological um, so, uh, so systems, okay? I still have my computer, I still have my brain and somehow we need to make one work with the other. Okay, now, um, I've put this link on, and this particular YouTube video shows the stimulations coming in with respect to time. So there is an example called uh, a research field called oscillatory networks. And what, what it looks at is when a particular signal comes in at a particular tone or frequency, then it appears to stimulate an area of the brain. Well, that sounds great. It sounds like we've, we've solved all, all reasoning on how to actually create an artificial intelligence. We just have networks of oscillations that will match what the input stimuli is, and they just oscillate when they receive that stimuli. Brilliant. Not quite. It's almost there but not quite, because we have the ability to learn. So if you provide an oscillatory network which resonates at say 500 Hertz, but a 600 Hertz uh, stimuli comes in, is the 500 Hertz supposed to say, ah, yes, the 600 is coming in? Well, it, it wouldn't because there'd be a mismatch. But what happens if you have a circuit or software that could adapt that frequency response to change from 500 over a period of time because it's, it's been built as if it's able to understand 500 hertz and yet it's constantly receiving 600 hertz. Over a period of time, you actually wanted to think, actually, there's no 500 hertz, so that's a waste of time. I want to adapt my frequency response to the 600 hertz. And then over a period of time, it says, ah, 600 is still coming in. I can say, yes, that, uh, that is now a signal I should respond to. So we need a solution which is flexible in, what, in it, the stimulus that it receives. And machine learning is not uh, necessarily flexible. It, you have to break the model and recreate the model. Oscillatory networks, they're fixed frequencies and, and they try to home in on uh, specific frequencies by looking at uh, combinations of frequencies. Uh, I'll give you another example. You could get a harmonic if you had a 500 hertz and a 600 hertz. You multiply those together and you've got something like 30,000 hertz. So if a frequency of 30,000 hertz uh, comes in, then both 500 and 600 hertz receptive circuits would actually uh, trigger, okay? Hopefully you, you're following me uh, with this. But 
as I say, oscillatory networks don't have those dynamics built in. Neuromorphic. I said it's an approach to neuromorphic uh, AI. So what is neuromorphic? Um, now, it's to utilize an inherent physical property of an electronic component to emulate abstracted elements of neural function. So basically, if you look at the way charge flows across a transistor, uh, it, it's possible to think of that as being the membrane of a neuron. And Carver Mead um, is considered the, the founder of neuromorphic engineering. And what he was basically saying that if you could find various uh, electrical circuits which could uh, perform the abstracted function of what's actually happening in a neuron, then you could have a uh, analog version of an uh, with an electronic brain. Okay. This, that was back in 1985 that all this started. And if you think it's now 2020, it's a long time and we haven't necessarily seen uh, anything um, come of it yet. However, the field of neuromorphics is coming to the forefront. Um, there's quite a few startups and a couple of big names uh, that, that you'll see in the marketplace now. So as I was explaining, neuromorphic, it's about hardware and how charge flows across silicon circuits. If you really want to get into the hardware, there's two conferences each year, virtually, of course, with COVID-19. Uh, there's Kappa Kacha, which occurs around about May time, and Telluride, which is around about July time. Um, let's say, barring uh, any travel restrictions or virtual conferencing, these are the two that you would be discussing topics of how neuromorphic systems could potentially be used for intelligence. But this is our Dev Summit. It's a software developer summit. So are we coming to a conclusion? We'll see. So we want a spiking neural network that isn't, isn't just about the spikes. We don't want to have to code for particular distances or number of spikes. We don't, we know that it, uh, with machine learning, if you create a model for particular spikes, when another set of spikes comes along that it doesn't know, then the model breaks. What we're actually looking for is some sort of stimuli that occurs um, into an application or circuit which actually allows emergent uh, behavior to occur. Which basically means, if, if you think about it, an individual neuron doesn't know that the sun is in the sky or uh, that there's wind blowing. So you, you may feel the wind across your face, the sun um, you can see although don't look into the sun. Um, what, what a group of neurons combined and through a process of learning, then you actually understand more than what an individual neuron is capable of. So intelligence is an emergent property. So how do we actually sort of code that the emergent properties? Well, I'd like to invite you to join in uh, development of some software. Now, this software uh, was actually part of my master's and, and still carries on through my PhD research, but don't do it just for me, do it because you're interested. Uh, interested. Uh, brain harmonics, what that does, it looks at actually abstracting the way neurons work. It forms oscillatory networks, but it allows the flexibility in the coding to actually learn and combine multiple input stimuli, multiple oscillations. And over a period of time, it will adapt. Now, what I'm looking to do is to grow the scale of this application to run across multiple systems, heterogeneous systems. Um, so ideally, ARM servers, that would be a great thing. Um, and whether for me personally, uh, looking after uh, Lenaro Data Center Cloud Group, I'm all about service. And uh, when we talk about HPC and AI, uh, then that definitely is about high performance systems. So I'd like uh, to see brain harmonics be running across supercomputers. Um, 
if that's the scale that the particular intelligence requires. So I am asking you if you'd like to go towards uh, the GitHub link there and uh, offer to collaborate with us. And uh, your help would be greatly appreciated. Now, all of that was a long talk about some very difficult topics. But brain harmonics is a neuromorphic approach. And what I'd like to say is just because the root itself is hard should not be the defining problem. In other, in other words, just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Okay. Programming to find intelligence or to create an intelligence is hard. Okay. If it was easy, we would have already done it by now when we haven't. But let, let's, uh, let's not just be put off that because the route is hard, um, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't do it. Okay. So I hope to see you uh, contributing to Brain Harmonics or at least finding out more about Lenaro and all our open source um, software commitments that we do, where we uh, help upstream um, sort of patches to even the Linux kernel. Thank you for your time.